Hey everyone, I'm Ashes. And I'm Will. And, and this, this is, is Ashes, Ashes and, and Will Do Disney. Disney. Each week, one of us will tell the other the history, facts, and stories behind the rides and attractions of Disney that have made special memories for generations. Keep in mind that Ashes and Will Do Disney is not affiliated with or employed by the Walt Disney Company, and our views and opinions do not reflect theirs. Now it's time to sit back, relax, and put on your ears, because it's time for Ashes and Will Do Disney. Oh, hey there, Ashes. Hey, babe. How you doing? Oh, it's been a day. Work was fun. <laughs> I know you've had a day, dear. <laughs> yeah. Just to keep it kind of short, doing the real job today. Won't get into too many details, but essentially, with technical issues, I could not do my job for about five hours today. Sounds super exciting. Yeah, lots of sitting on the phone trying to get it figured out. My cell phone, because... My computer work phone did not work. Yeah, so you know, good times, good fun times. times. Yes. How are you doing? I'm a little exhausted as well from, you know, my actual job. Yeah. So I work night shift and my sleep is just all over the place sometimes and it gets very exhausting, especially when you have to be a person at night, but then sometimes you have to be a person and go to a class that starts at 8 o'clock in the morning. Right, right. So, and the, then potentially going back into work after doing these early mornings. Yeah, it gets a little, a little crazy. It's um, a little much. But I did get to practice um, breaking out of a chokehold today, so that was exciting. What? Yeah. Yeah, I know you went to your class this morning. I wasn't aware that it was like an MMA class. Um, so it was aggression management, and basically, it at the second half of the class was how to like break out of like if someone grabs you, like how to break out of different holds. And I'm not gonna lie, most of the time I just thought about like, sweet, I can use this on my husband. So because for the amount of times I choke you, I mean, not choke me, but you know. I, I, told I mean, you. no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just rustling around and playing. Okay. Messing with the kids. William does not choke me, everyone. I promise. Yeah, let's go ahead and clarify that. <laughs> I do not do that. That She has no need to actually defend herself from that from me. No, just playing. So oh. it was fun. So we're getting close to Halloween here. I know. It's exciting. I do love Halloween. I know. Me too. We got our... Chip and Dale coming out of a jack-o'-lantern that we saw at Disney World. We saw it at the Contemporary Resort when we went to breakfast. And we kind of hemmed and hawed on it because we really liked it. But honestly, we wouldn't have had room to bring it back. So we finally just ordered it from Shop Disney. Um, we barely had room to bring, like, you know, anything back. The popcorn bucket almost didn't make it. But I, you made it work. I know. It was cute. But yes, I love our new little Chip and Dale. But... I also adore the new Chippendale cartoons, so it holds like an extra special place in my heart. I laughed when you said that you and I were basically Chippendale and how you were Chip and I was Dale, but, and essentially you'll get kind of worked oh, yeah. up and look at the severity of a situation while I'm sitting off to the side just kind of giggling about it, oblivious to what's actually happening. And Like, specific, I mean, so much. Like, I feel like you and I can be Chippendale so much. Like, I thought about that episode where... They really wanted the walnut like opener, like, <laughs> like the nutcracker, and like what is it? Chip went off like the complete deep end, like just living in the like waiting for the Amazon delivery. Yeah, he was living in the mailbox waiting for another. Yeah, nutcracker just completely to show up. like fixated and focused on it. And Dale's just like derping around, living his best life, like watching YouTube videos. He was appreciating all the other cool stuff that was coming in the mail. Um, okay, you could twist it like that, but... Well, I mean, that's what it was. I mean, there was, like, iPads and toys and stuff, and he was playing with all of it, so... Look, we... We just make a good team, I guess. We all know that Chip is clearly the brains of the operation. Oh, 100%. So... No one's denying that. (laughs) We just all know that Chip can be a little crazy, too. Like Chip and Dale, they balance each other out. Yes. Okay, so we know that Halloween's coming up. Correct, which I've got a Halloween quiz for you. Awesome. Okay, now, we'll, we'll do that first, and then I'll tell you what I'm doing. Yeah, we'll do that first here, because this shouldn't take you too long. Okay. Now, normally I do the 
which this are you, which that are you. And I almost did that. I almost did a which character should make your Halloween costume. Oh, okay. I mean, that would have been fun. It would have been fun. I took the quiz. Sally should have made my costume according to my results. Okay, I mean. But I'm going to hit you with a little trivia this time. Oh, no. If you don't do well on this, I'm going to be kind of disappointed. Okay. So, in the spirit of the season, pumpkins are being carved and costumes are being crafted. But there's a musical tradition that is just as important. That involves screaming out the lyrics to This is Halloween from Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas at the top of your lungs, usually as soon as October 1st rolls around, unless Uh, you're us. Incorrect. That is a year-round song. Yeah, if it's a day that ends in Y, it's okay to sing that song in our house. Yeah. But this new ritual requires the kind of musical knowledge that would make Jack Skellington proud. So just how well do you know the words to the chilling chant? Find out. Okay, I'm slightly excited but also this is rude because i'm going off of like very broken sleep and a few hours of it so i'm a little scared i tried to go easy with this though because i knew Uh, i was giving you trivia and that's not usually your bag uh, but okay let's hear it okay so blank and blank of every age boys and girls of every age okay this is halloween do you need the choices this is Halloween. Everybody's turning green. Everybody make a scene. Everybody needs a queen. Everybody face your screen. That's it, the second one. Yes, everybody make a scene. Yes. Okay. Teeth ground sharp and blank Eyes glowing, glowing blank. red. Okay. Thank God I spent, like, years listening to this soundtrack. Well, I mean, we played it at our wedding reception, so. Yeah, you know. Where is the one with fingers like snakes hiding? Under your bed? Under your stairs? In your closet? In your head? Well, that one's under the stairs. Correct. Everyone blank to the pumpkin blank. Hail. What are those choices? Okay. I got to like sing it in my head. So it's going to take me a long time. I don't think people want to sing wait. it out loud. Okay. Just give me the choices. <laughs> so everyone sing to the pumpkin king. Everyone cry to the pumpkin patch. Okay. That's everyone funny. hail to the pumpkin song. Everyone hail to the pumpkin song. Round that corner man hatching an evil plan. Lurking in a white van. (laughs) Ha! That's so creepy. (laughs) Banging on a tin can or hiding in the trash can? Hiding in the trash can. Yes. What three colors are mentioned in the song? Red, black, slimy green. Black, orange, ghostly white. Red, orange, gory green. Or red, orange, ghastly black. Okay. Red, black, and slimy green. Was that a choice? That was. Okay. Take the blank and roll the blank. I need, I, I do, I told you I'm going off little sleep. I do need options here. Otherwise, it's going to take far too long for me to go through it in my head. Take the lead and roll the heads. No. Take the chance and roll the dice. Take the fall and roll the ball. (laughs) Take the gander and roll the goose. Oh, man. That's that's a close one between gander and goose. It's the second one. Okay. Take a chance and roll the dice. I am the blank with the tearaway blank. Vampire teeth. So I am the vampire with the tearaway teeth. I am the skeleton with the tearaway skull. No. I am the clown with the tearaway face. That one. Life's no fun without your fair share. A bold dare, your own lair, or a good scare? Good scare. That was a little dicey, but you got 100%. Okay, rude. (laughs) I would love to see you function off the amount of sleep that I get. Actually, I wouldn't, because you would be the grumpiest, not fun human. I was like, you don't want to see me do that. I don't, but, you know. I mean, I'm grumpy off a full night's sleep. It's very true, but I would enjoy it for just a few minutes as like a fly on the wall and just being like, huh, 
is kind of like um, our friend Erica, who thought that she could get her and I always have this like debate. She loves to stay on property at the uh, Disney World, right? Oh my gosh! Yeah, and I know. her and her like military discount, which clearly we don't get, and she's like, we can stay there for like four dollars a night. Clearly not four dollars a night, but. Their military discount, they can get it, like, super cheap. You would think it's $4 a night the way she talks about it. And we've been talking about planning a girls trip with some of the girls from work, which, Jessica, when you hear this, you are more than welcome to come as well. Sonia and Teresa are going to also. Anyways, so Erica thought that she we could get the same deal when we go to Disneyland. And I was like, no, no, Disneyland is not the same as Disney World. Like, Disneyland only has three Disney properties. There's not hotels. a lot of options to stay on property. Yeah, so literally, I was like, no, you can't get this. And she's like, yes, I can. I was like, cool, okay, go for it, do it. So she called the travel agent to, like, use her military discount to be like, look, this is when we want to go, like, explain the whole situation, and was like, look, I really need you to help me prove her wrong here. And, like, straight up was telling the travel agent lady, like, "Um, I need you to help me prove ash is wrong and erica was totally wrong totally wrong and it was basically one of the best days ever it's pretty glorious especially with i mean myself included with how hard of a time we gave you driving to the park one day and you were so confident that you didn't need the gps on the phone anymore cool it's a great story (laughs) okay so there was one day we were driving to disney world and I thought I knew the way to Disney World. We were going to Hollywood Studios. Yep. And we'd already gone to Hollywood Studios. And I was like, cool, I got this. I don't need the GPS. And I did very confidently put down my phone and say I didn't need it. And then drove right on past the exit. Mind you, I did say, oh, crap. Like, pretty sure that was my exit. And got relentlessly ridiculed for about 100 years. I'm for, you know, not getting us to Hollywood Studios without our GPS. It was just how confident you were. So that's why it's nice that she got zinged on it for how confident she was. I'm pretty sure everyone wants to hear stories, though, now. So. I would love to hear some stories because it's Halloween time, and I think they're going to be spooky. Okay. I originally, for Halloween, wanted to look into Tower of Terror because it was, you know, spooky Tower of obvious. Terror. Right? One of your favorite rides. One of my favorites. However, um, it's... Not a scary story. Like, I will definitely tell you how Tower of Terror came to be. It's actually super interesting, entertaining, kind of funny, but not scary at all. So Saving it? Yeah, I was like, it's Halloween. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to just do something, you know, I got to do something scary. We all know I like the creepy weird stuff. Well, yeah. So, we all know that I like to find some of those weird, creepy stories to just throw in at the end. And I have this big, giant, like, running list of stories that I found that I just kind of keep in a file to throw in every now and again when I need to. Yep. And usually I try to correlate them with a specific ride. So, you know, whatever ride I'm doing, you know, I'll throw a story in that goes with it. Well, there's a couple stories that I've come across that are just more so about Disney or don't mention a specific ride they just kind of maybe talk about multiple rides or just kind of disney in general sure so i thought i would read you some of the fun stories that i've found fun is a loose term they're kind of creepy good good Um, so is this just an episode then of creepy disney stories it is literally just an episode of creepy disney stories so i love this and i'm going to tell you why i love this before you get started here so those that know us know that we are a huge fan of the podcast Real Life Ghost Stories, and essentially the host reads ghost stories. Essentially, she does her yep. research and tells ghost stories. And so I feel like this is really cool because, one, it was kind of an inspiration for us to start our own podcast, and I feel like this is a little tribute. So if Emma ever actually happens to listen to our podcast. Oh my gosh, if Emma ever did listen to our podcast, that would be amazing. That would be great. And just know that you've been a big inspiration for our show. And hopefully you see this as a little tribute if you ever get to listen to it. Awesome. Okay, babe. Buckle up. I hope you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. So this one is 
posted by a Reddit user called Well There's That. <laughs> so I thought that was neat. And uh, it's called My Strangest Paranormal Experience, Disney. I had several paranormal experiences throughout my 23 years of life. This one, however, is by far the strangest and most mind-boggling one that I have had. Backstory. I worked at Walt Disney for four years. Most days, I looked a little like this. And it's a picture of Chip and Dale. Okay. It was a fantastic job. I was happy every day. I left because I had to continue school. This experience happened at work, and it was actually one of my last shifts before I would be leaving the company for good. I was working at the restaurant Garden Grill in the Land Pavilion at Epcot, which we know is one of my favorites. It's your favorite. The fun thing about this restaurant was the layout of it. There were two stories of the restaurant, and to complete our quote, rotation, you would complete one layer and go up or down the stairs and complete the other layer and go up or down the stairs again. And the main goal of our, quote, set was to see every guest in the restaurant at least once. Also, there is only one way in or out for guests, which was down the ramp. The greatest part about working at this restaurant was the final set of the night. Usually by 9 p.m., the restaurant would be mostly cleared out with three or four families remaining. And we would either be done with the set in 10 minutes and get out early, or we would get time to play around in the restaurant and have fun. Experience begins. It was the last set of the night. Three families left in the restaurant. Two lower, one upper. Four characters. Two begin up, two begin down. I started up and greeted the family on the top section. I completed the circle and was about to go down my set of stairs when I saw the back of a man's head just sit, head sitting just to the right of the stairs I was about to descend. Well, I had to greet everyone in the restaurant at least one time, so I came up to his table and signaled hello. He serenely, yes serenely, his movements were so elegant, turned to me and grinned widely. He didn't have a drink, a place setting, and was not wearing a main a name tag, you know, like a manager would. Instead, he grasped the menu of the restaurant in his hands and laid it carefully onto the table when I waved. Why, hello there, Dale, he said to me. His voice was slightly raspy. He, he had dark, slick hair and was wearing a long sleeve button down shirt with a vest over it and a tie. He also had a mustache with an otherwise clean-shaven face. I thought it was cool that an adult male knew which chipmunk he was talking to. Usually no one knows Chip from Dale. Again, I waved and extended my hand to shake his. He gave me a firm handshake and put his hands back on the menu, picking it up. I pointed to the menu, rubbed my stomach, and held my arms up in a question mark position, asking kind of a, are you hungry, are you eating? It was odd because it looked like he had just been seated for dinner, but the restaurant would be closing in 15 minutes and had stopped seating new guests about 30 minutes ago. The man laughed and shook his head and said, oh no, nothing for me today, Dale. I nodded and glanced over the railing to see if any of the other families or characters were in my view none were. He spoke to me again. I'm just here to check up on things, see how they are going. I looked back at him, a little confused. I didn't react much because I started feeling weird. The man put the menu down again and he touched my arm. Through the fur, I felt static and a swift feeling of pride. Go say hi to the children down there. The restaurant is closing. Again, I nodded, gave him a salute, and before I moved to go down the stairs again, I signaled to him, pointed at my chest, and put my finger to the table. I'll be back, he nodded. All right, Dale, and picked up the menu. I went down the stairs and rounded to the other side of the restaurant and gave hugs and kisses to the last two families. All the other characters were already back inside, done for the night. My captain, the character manager for the night, said, Found you, Dale, took me by the arm and went to guide me back inside. I gave her the 
one second signal and ran back to the other side of the restaurant to find the man again. There was no one there. The menu was still in the middle of the table, instead of tucked behind the napkin holder, but the chair had been pushed in. No one had walked out behind me while I was on the other side with the families, and the only other way out was through a door that leads to the kitchen and into the backstage area. But the man was not wearing a Disney costume, nor did he have a name tag on. I went through the backstage door and rejoined my cast members upstairs. The instant I was up there, I brought up the man. I was greeted with, what man? The dad with his kids? And the, and head shaking. When I went home that night, I reflected. I truly believe this was a paranormal experience. At first I thought I had met Walt Disney himself. However, I would have recognized him surely. And Walt never actually saw Epcot, which leaves me to now believe I met an Imagineer or some other sort of operator. It boggles me, because I knew something didn't feel normal when I was interacting with him. His interpretation of my pantomime was too good. The fact that he knew the difference between Chip and Dale was amazing. Every now and then, I start trying to look into Disney's past and find photos of someone I might recognize. No luck yet, but his image is certainly burned into my memory. I always make a point now when I'm on a Disney vacation to visit the land and hang out there for a while, waiting to catch a glimpse of this man. For one reason or another, I feel like I will see him again. That's a cool story. I love that story. That's a great story. I mean, whether it actually happened or not, or regardless there, that's, that's just a nice story. It's pretty touching. And that was my initial thought as soon as you said he had a mustache. I was like, oh, you saw the ghost of Walt. Yeah. And he talked about, well, he never saw Epcot. Well, to me, that's like an absolute reason for Walt to go haunt Epcot because that was like his baby. That was his big project he oh, wanted I know. to do. Yeah, absolutely. But I also think that he would totally recognize Exactly. Walt. The fact that, yeah, he said that it didn't look like Walt Disney to me says it wouldn't be the ghost of Walt Disney. Yeah, I think he's probably right. It's got to be some sort of, like, Imagineer or someone who, someone actually who did had work. something to do with the park. Yeah, but... someone who did actually work on Epcot, got that stuff set up, yeah. and wanted to see it and how it was thriving, so. But, of course, not scary, just I adore It's a touching that story. story. It's like a touching ghost story. Yeah, so. it is. And, you know, when I said at the beginning, you know, regardless of whether it happened or not, I'm going to treat all these stories as if they happened. Well, they're all from Reddit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. But as we discuss, we'll just treat it as if they happened. Yes. Okay, ready for the next one? There's four of them total. Okay. Okay, experiences working at Disneyland. During the late 1990s and early 2000s, the Disneyland Resort faced a number of serious incidences, including several severe injuries and even a few deaths. As has been covered in the media, one person was killed and several injured in a malfunction of the sailing ship Columbia ride in 1998. Following an extensive investigation by the California Department of Health and Safety, Disney was fined for, quote, serious violations, including the failure to adequately train park employees, implement proper safety features, or maintain attractions correctly. The accidents continued into the early 2000s, including a collision on the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad that killed one guest and maimed several others. Mysteriously, several high-level park officials were fired during this time, some of which later filed whistleblower lawsuits. One manager at the park warned Disney officials of poor safety of attractions in 1996 and was subsequently laid off. It does seem bizarre that such a wealthy corporation would have a poor standard of maintenance. However, each Disney park does generally run separately with an independent set of finances. During the late 1990s, the California Disney Park ran into a significant economic ran into significant economic troubles with lower than expected attendance partially due to the competition with new nearby Six Flags Park. The local resort management simply could not afford to continue the quality of maintenance one would expect from a Disney park. Budgets were slashed, 
operations and services suffered, and several people died or were injured as a result. At least, this is the official narrative. Disney Corp claims out of a population of nearly 650 million visitors to Disneyland Park in its history, the chances of death or injury are negligible for guests. However, as a park employee from 1994 to 2003, I can safely say that the number of reported deaths barely scratches the surface. While the park may have significantly improved from its prior status, some pretty bizarre stuff happened there in the late 90s, and only a small fraction of which has been picked up by the mainstream media or noticed by investigators, or even Disney management itself. As a nine-year worker under Mickey Mouse, a large amount of incredibly strange stuff happened, some of which I am at a loss to explain. In the summer of 1994, after graduating Anaheim Community College, I landed a job as a ride operator at Disneyland, located only a few miles from my apartment. I was offered a great paycheck, had the benefits of working in a familiar place of childhood nostalgia. The work itself was pretty simple loading guests onto the ride, making sure that all the rides, riders are secure, and then controlling the attraction from the, quote, dashboard. Disney had just implemented a new ride control system using a computerized panel and video cameras to keep watch over the ride. If you've ever been to a theme park, you've probably seen this system. The ride operator sits over a control panel with different monitors displaying video camera footage of the rides and can control the movement of the cars. I largely worked in, fantasy, in the Fantasyland section of the park, particularly working the longest shifts on Matterhorn bobsleds. Still need to ride that ride. I've never been oh, on it. My gosh, it's so amazing. Well, when you get to go to Disneyland soon, hopefully you'll get to go. Oh, I'm gonna single rider that one. <laughs> it's a pretty <laughs> fun one. At first, my employment seemed great. While the shifts could be monotonous, the salary was very high, and I was even able to move from my smaller apartment into a townhouse, farther from the park. For these reasons, while I was considering the job only for a temporary position over the summer, I decided to stay with Disney for a, a longer time. This is the point where stuff begins to get a little weird. Well, strange. In the spring of 1995, Disney made all the park employees sign a somewhat disconcerting contract, barring us from discussing park operations with members of the public. This essentially meant that I would be unable to talk about my job with my friends and family. It also meant that any whistleblowers who complained about the safety in the attractions could be laid off. Some of my fellow workers were outraged. Personally, the contract didn't not really concern me as I had no reason to discuss the specifics of my work with the members of the general public. It was also at the same time in April or May of 1995 that these quote anomalies started to occur. These were minor but somewhat disturbing events that confused me and my fellow ride operators. For example, while running the Matterhorn bobsleds once, I strapped in two young brothers, probably five or six years old. I next sat down at the dashboard to keep track of the ride. The thing is, I never saw the brothers' bobsled on any of the monitors. It was as if they had vanished. Naturally, I was somewhat disturbed and assumed that their car had broken down at some point on the track and thus was unable to continue to the other sections of the track that were monitored by the video cameras. However, the other cars continued to move along the track. About seven minutes after I sent off the two young kids, their car mysteriously arrived back at the station, despite apparently not traveling through any of the monitored sections of the rail. Even stranger, the ride typically only lasts a couple of minutes, only takes a couple of minutes to complete, and seven minutes is almost unheard of. The two kids, upon stepping out of the ride, seemed somehow disturbed. While not seeming afraid or traumatized in any way, they just seemed somehow confused or disoriented. After they left the ride, I never saw them in the park again. Which, I will say real quick, I mean, how many... Do they really recognize all the kids they see in a park? I was going to say, did he look at other guests and be like, oh, you're back? I mean, like, that might work for me. 
who like goes on the haunted mansion ridiculous <laughs> like amounts times. of time, but <laughs> I'm an anomaly in that case. Right. Okay. After reporting this incident to my superiors, I was ignored. One park official even threatened me. This would be the first this would be the first such anomaly and the cast member team would see a considerable number of such events in the future. Some of these incidences were explainable. Park officials claimed that video camera equipment was probably malfunctioning and that young kids were sometimes just playing pranks on us ride operators. It occurred often, for example, that certain bobsleds became frequently invisible to the cameras or that positions of the riders within the bobsleds would mysteriously change, change once they exited the ride. Riders sitting in the front of the sled during the beginning of the ride would end up at the back and so on. Again, park management chalked up many of these incidences to video camera malfunctions. Certainly, the ride vehicles were difficult to spot anyways against the dark background, as well as guests intentionally pulling pranks on staff, often by switching seats. However, my fellow employees and I found this official explanation not entirely convincing. For example, certain bobsleds were more likely to experience anomalies than others, and the maintenance team had even had a running joke about keeping track of which ride vehicles were haunted. Even stranger, however, the riders that experienced these anomalies always seemed somewhat confused and even disturbed, and often were never spotted again on the park premises. By 1996, my fellow employees and I had estimated that approximately 5% of the rides on Matterhorn were anomalies. Of these, a very few, perhaps a tenth of all anomalies, were extremely strange and difficult to explain. For example, bobsleds would occasionally exit the ride in the wrong order or take obscenely long lengths of time, often half hour or more, to complete the ride. The riders experiencing these anomalies were almost always children. It was around this time that the incidences began to spread to other parts of the park. Ride operators at Splash Mountain began reporting similar events, and soon, within a few months, anomalies were occurring all across the park. Official management was no help. We decided to simply ignore the problem knowing at least that guests would always exit the ride safely, even if somewhat disoriented. It was in January of 1997 that we had realized the severity of the situation. A brother and sister, probably eight or nine years old, had entered Splash Mountain on one of the smaller ride vehicles. They did not show up on any of the ride monitors waiting over two hours with their car failing to reach the station. The park had reached closing time and we were ordered to shut down the ride. The team sent in Tim, a fellow maintenance operator, to search for the children. He never exited the ride. Walking out of the park that night, I swear I could see the faces of those children vaguely in the mist along the edges of fantasy land. Due to the nature of our contract, we were unable to discuss any of these events with anyone. Several of my fellow employees quit shortly after, but I decided to stay as I badly needed the money. Throughout 1997 and 1998, we counted several dozen such disappearances, with riders never exiting the rides. Strangely, despite the vanishing of several kids, we never received any complaints from parents who naturally should have inquired as to the whereabouts of their children. What kind of parents would just leave their children at Disneyland? Bad ones. <laughs> this was about the same time as some of the reported accidents at the park, ultimately leading to the, the major investigation. Many in the media blame these events on poor maintenance, but I sense that something far darker was occurring. In 2003, I ultimately left Disneyland, landing a high-level management position in an insurance firm. This story really has no point that I can see. I have a little idea what happened at Disneyland during those years, and if anybody has any leads, please let me know. And this was by a Reddit user named Jacob. 
So they're blaming poor maintenance on kids like vanishing into like wormholes, essentially. I mean, basically. Hey, these kids disappeared. Yeah, <laughs> this ride needs some work. <laughs> Should really uh, get some oil on that squeaky yeah. wheel over there. <laughs> So that way these kids stop disappearing. That's my biggest takeaway from that is, you know, it makes sense when people are leaving the ride. Yeah, your your camera just glitched, but we're blaming poor ride maintenance on vanishing park guests. <laughs> Honestly, to me, it sounds like the most, like, management type, like, answer. Like, stereotypical, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, they're just this thing. Like, I don't think this is, like, the higher ups at, you know mickey mouse trying to hide something like this just sounds like any bigger corporation being like yep it's not a real thing it's like men in black <laughs> they tried to explain it all like whenever there were big like explosions they would flash their eyes to erase their memory and be like swamp gas i mean basically <laughs> and if anyone would have them you know technology or something to have something like that it'd be it would disney be disney Okay, we're also not done with Jacob here. Okay. So I do have some stuff from the comments um, that I was going to read, but Jacob also wrote a follow-up post. So okay. do you want to hear comments first or the follow-up post first? Mm, let's do some comments. Okay, so some of the comments were just, like, some other experiences. So from the comments, Odd Genetics says... Now that you bring this up, it reminds me of something I hadn't thought about in years. My girl and I had season passes to Disneyland and used to go there all the time. We would ride the same rides, stop at the vineyard, and have drinks. We always ended the day with Space Mountain, as we'd ride the monorail into the park and pick up fast passes for it before we did anything. The last time we went, about three years ago, it was in the middle of November. We hopped on the ride about 7 p.m. with a train full of other passengers. It pulled forward, but instead of going to the right, the track changed and went immediately to the left, to the maintenance door. They had us all get out of the ride, row by row, and walk through the server room area back to the main ride queue. They proceeded to put everyone back on the train, but asked my girlfriend and I to wait. They put us on the next train, alone. I don't remember anything except a few seconds of darkness. We came back out and it was 9 p.m. I don't really remember the ride home, which is about 30 minutes. I also don't remember much about several days after it happened. In the weeks following, I developed a drinking problem and we've never spoken to each other about it. And we've never gone back to the park. Are they sure they didn't have the drinking problem before getting on the train, and that's why <laughs> things were blacked out? I don't know, but either way, it's... That was kind of mean, but nonetheless. That is mean, William. Jeez. <laughs> <sighs> Rude. Either way, kind of a weird experience. Yeah. Yeah. whatever. Yeah. Sir. Glitch Cats says, As a former cast member of The Mouse myself, I can say that Disneyland does have its moments of weirdness. While working in stores, I have seen things fly off the shelf. Not fall as if the shelf was packed, but literally get picked up and thrown. <laughs> in the store I worked at, the cast members would know of there almost always being one red balloon stuck on the ceiling that no one could get down. One night after closing... One of our managers was making her last rounds and saw the balloon float down from the ceiling and move around the store as if it was being pulled. Pennywise. I have legit, that was my thought. <laughs> in connection to the story, in the past, in past years, there used to be a kid who would always come to our store with a red balloon who had passed away. Cast members know their regulars, and he was one. Coincidence? I think not. So I'm just picturing the red balloon on the ceiling and a bunch of cast members like trying to jump up and grab it and they just, it's just quite a little bit out of reach. I mean, I'm sure they probably used like, you know, step stools. And well, you said they could never get it down. So I'm sure they did too, but I'm just picturing like five or six cast members all trying to jump up and grab it and they just can't quite get it. Oh, William. <laughs> <laughs> um... 
Sean Muir said, bit late, but I feel like I have to share this now. About two and a half years ago, mind you, this was all seven years ago when this was posted, so all this stuff was probably like ten years Nine ago. Nine or ten years ago. Yeah. About two and a half years ago, I went to Tokyo Disneyland while on a school trip to Japan, and I am a huge chicken and wasn't up for many rides. Yet the one ride I was up for was the Haunted Mansion, just as the other creepy pasta loving edgy 14 year olds would be. Two weird things happened on the ride, one of which can logically be explained and could be a total coincidence, and the other not so much. First thing, after walking through a few rooms, the actual ride starts and everyone gets into these little two person carriages. After Call about. the Doom Buggy. Okay, sir. After about two minutes into the ride, there's a really long corridor. I assume it's made to look really long with mirrors. Correct. Probably, yeah. <laughs> and an audio bit that is played to make it seem like someone is screaming from the other end of the corridor. On this particular run, right after the scream, all the carriages stopped for about a minute or two. Looking over our videos of the ride afterwards, this obviously was not planned, which happens a lot in Haunted Mansion. I don't think any of the stops are planned. <laughs> no, but they happen often. Yes. The odder thing is that... Huh, otter. Uh, <laughs> it was probably the more odd, odd. thing <laughs> is that they stopped when our carriage was straight facing down the corridor. Coincidental, I guess, but weird. I mean, it's just where you're stopped. Now, the really weird thing I was sharing this carriage with my boyfriend at the time, and two of our friends were in the carriage in front of us. The whole time we were stopped, I was facing towards their carriage to see if they'd turn around and we could exchange some WTF gestures, but they didn't. After the ride, they started teasing me and my boyfriend saying that they caught us. We had no clue what they were talking about. They said they saw us kissing when we were stopped near the corridor. We hadn't kissed each other yet, ever at this point. This is my most WTF thing that has ever happened to me, and I still think about it sometimes. Like, what was their perception war like, was their perception warped while we were paused at the ride? Was my boyfriend and I's memories wiped and erased with something else? <laughs> Gives me the shivers. So, one, phantom love, it's a thing. Phantom love. Love in the afterlife. They saw ghosts kissing. Well, but they said it was real. I mean, they're real people. Yeah, but maybe they didn't actually see them. Okay. Two, I was just thinking about when she was talking about the ride stopping and how it was unplanned. I was just thinking about Muppets Haunted Mansion. Oh, I know. They're their big musical number, and then the ride stops and does the announcement about why it stopped. That Just was like hilarious. So yeah, if you haven't checked out Muppets Haunted Mansion, definitely do so. It's hilarious. It is hilarious. Okay, so Jacob also wrote um, an update to like his little ex experiences working at Disneyland because he had like a lot of comments. So he says, many of you commented on my previous post, expressing inquiries and concerns about my experiences as an employee at Disneyland in the late 90s. Here, I will clear up some misunderstandings regarding that post, as well as describing some recent developments that have occurred. Some asked about the whereabouts of Tim, the maintenance worker who searched for the children, the two children who disappeared on the Splash Mountain ride. As I said in my previous post of January, in January 1997, two young kids, a brother and sister, vanished on board the attraction. Due to poor maintenance. Due to, yeah, squeaky wheel, you know. <laughs> Their ride vehicle failed to show up on the video camera monitoring system, and after two hours, the park had reached closing time. Our ride team sent Tim to search for the missing children. As I said before, Tim never left the attraction that night. The next day, Tim showed up for his shift as usual. <laughs> Asking him about his experience, Tim said that he left the park at 10 p.m. last night, two hours before the park closed and that he had no recollection of entering Splash Mountain to search for those missing kids. Kind of interesting. All right. The two children were never found, and, in successive years, our team would count several such cases of disappearance. The supposed parents of the missing kids 
never contacted the park to ask about them, and no missing children cases were filed. Overall, these events were extremely odd and disconcerting. Our team also counted a large number of anomalies, odd events that occurred on some attractions as much as 5% of the time. Often passengers would exit the ride vehicles in the wrong order compared to how they got loaded in and vehicles would not show up on the video camera monitoring system. Guests caught in an anomaly often seemed slightly disturbed and confused. I had even asked a few of those guests what had happened, but most simply said that they could not remember. As I described in the previous post, the first anomaly I spotted on the Matterhorn bobsleds was the disappearance of a ride vehicle seating two young brothers. Their subsequent arrival back at the station after seven minutes after I loaded them in. During that time at Disneyland in the mid-90s, park attendance was actually fairly low due to competition with newer parks in the LA area. As a result, guests were fairly guests were often able to ride rides um, of the attractions multiple times in a row. Certainly different than like you know current wait times of the park. Right. While the resort remained crowded in the summer and holiday season, during springtime, when this anomaly occurred, queues were very short, and it was unusual to see two children not attempt to ride the same attraction again. I asked some of my fellow employees working the other rides if they had seen the two brothers before, and none said that they could remember seeing them. Often, when riders would be caught in an anomaly, no other park employees would remember seeing them in a line at any other ride after that. In other words, it seemed as if guests who experienced an anomaly would just leave the park. After describing my experiences in the previous post, I decided to contact some of my old friends and acquaintances from the Disneyland Resort. Yesterday, I emailed a friend of mine who worked a shift at Big Thunder Mountain Railroad from 1997 to 2001 he prefers to remain unnamed. He just responded a couple of hours ago and I am somewhat concerned by his message. This is what he had to say. Hey Jacob, it's no secret that some weird stuff happened at Disneyland back in the 90s. The maintenance crew at Thunder Mountain even kept track of which vehicles were haunted. At first, I thought that kids were probably just playing pranks, switching seats mid-ride for example. After one car carrying a family of four came through, came to the station 35 minutes late. However, I knew something bizarre was going on. I placed camcorders at the front of the haunted ride vehicles after that. After a week, I took the cameras home and watched the footage. I was scared poopless. <laughs> Most of the footage was fairly standard, showing the ride vehicles moving along the regular track. However, on one ride, I saw the car, after entering one of the interior mountain sections, turn into what looked like an opened emergency exit door. After that, for a couple of minutes, the car traveled through what looked like a maintenance section, with lots of unfinished electrical furnishings going at about 10 to 15 miles per hour. After perhaps two minutes of this, the screen went static. Eight minutes later, the static subsided, showing a car arriving at the station. Indeed, I did remember from two days before loading a couple of kids in one of the vehicles, and they didn't arrive back for ten minutes. The strange thing is, though, when I rewinded the tape and played it again, the car never turned it into the maintenance section. It just went along as usual. I could swear, though, viewing that tape gave me an extreme eerie feeling as if being watched. On other parts of the tape where the cars entered the interior of the mountain, I think I could see a vague outline of a dark figure. When I went to work the next day, a Disney official, probably from corporate, threatened me, saying that meddling in affairs that are not your concern could result in serious consequences. Shortly after that, when I returned home that night, the tapes were not there. I really need to say even though you worked at Disney over a decade ago, you should still be careful about reporting these things. I think I will need to contact a few more of my fellow Disney workers from the 90s and parse out what is actually going on. 
I don't think this was a simple issue of malfunctioning video cameras or kids playing pranks. Jacob. I mean, that'd be a pretty impressive prank for someone to switch seats mid-ride. Right. Like the Matterhorn bobsleds. Well, I mean, yeah, those are one in front of the other, so bobsleds especially. And they're also going down a track. Well, I mean, yeah, but, you know, there's parts where I guess it's slow enough or waiting to load or something. I don't know. I don't know. I was thinking like Thunder Mountain switching places on there. That goes fast. That, that goes very hard. fast. And there's not a whole lot of stopping, and I, I wouldn't do it. Do you think that the kids that vanish with no parents reporting them are just ghost children riding the rides? I mean, maybe, especially because they're only seen on the one ride, and then people are like, I never saw them again after that. I mean,. I really feel like if actual not ghost children were repeatedly going missing from the parks that like I feel like there'd be a few parents being like there'd be some hey, parents yo. talking and I think we'd have a little bit more than a Scooby-Doo villain going you meddling kids I would have gotten away with it yeah also that many parents really just let their like five and six year olds just ride on these rides by themselves I mean maybe Remember that time we were at Animal Kingdom and, like, we saw those kids, like, blasting down the hallway, like, without parents? And then, like, five minutes later, as we're walking down the hall, we see, like, another, like, we see a set of adults. And the dad was all like, oh, this was a quiet adult place. I'd be totally freaked out about them running. Yeah, I mean, I guess, legit, things were different in the 90s. Yeah. And when we went to Animal Kingdom and that happened, that was, like, early 2000s. Yeah. I don't know. But still, I feel like it's got to be ghost children. If we're, again, we're presuming that all these stories actually happened and everybody's telling the truth, then that would be my theory. And that's why they're only being seen on one ride and then vanishing from the park, essentially, because they're doing their one ride that they haunt and they're not going to another ride. I mean, especially if I died as a young child and came back as a ghost... Legit, I feel like Disneyland would be where it's at. That's where it's at. Like. And totally, Tim, the maintenance man, men in black situation right there. <laughs> Legit. Totally, like, he walked on and he got blasted with that thing, and he was told, like, You hey, went home at 10 p.m. Yeah, you went home at 10 p.m. No one asked you to come on this ride to investigate, and so he stumbled out of there. And hey, at least he, uh came back to work the next day. He came back to work the next day, but 100%, that's a men in black. (laughs) Like, someone asked him to go on Splash Mountain to go investigate. As soon as he walked in, there they were. They put on their Ray-Ban glasses and blasted him in the eye and told him he went home at 10 p.m. and never came on. Yeah, legit. Tim. Tim. I hope he's still enjoying his job. (laughs) I mean, maybe if he's getting men in black mind erased every time something bad happens like yeah. gravity falls society of the blind eye yeah hopefully he's not like an old man mcgucket now oh i hope not poor tim poor tim hope tim's okay <laughs> <laughs> okay so here's another post that someone was just like hey everyone i worked at disneyland for five years and have some creepy ghost stories have any of you heard of some really good ones that you want to share okay this one is called Do You Want to See Something Cool by Used to Know Peace. Okay. So, um, okay, so this was a, this one is talking, is another like, yeah, I have a creepy story sure. from working at the park. Okay. So, yeah, about that other park, the one with the globe, I used to work there about six years ago. The one with the globe, let's give it a little more respect. It's Epcot. I know, they're obviously, they're trying to, you know. They're being edgy. Haven't you heard in all the other ones? They're like, don't talk about this stuff. But really, I think they're being edgy. They're just trying to be edgy. Anyway. Like I pictured that with like a New York accent. Yeah, you know that part. The one with the glow. William. (laughs) (laughs) I used to work there about six years ago. Seemed to be an easy job for little pay. I mean, everybody else says it pays good, but whatever. Yeah. Push a button, check a lap bar, send it away, do it again. Worked with some amazing people. And then there was him. He was a great trainer. I still use a lot of what he taught me today. 
We worked side by side for years. He had just finished loading a group and asked if I wanted to see something cool. He had brought me to a hidden area and there was ca- where there was catwalks and showed me around the park in quite a few different questionable areas and it was always neat to see how things worked or the behind the scenes areas and attractions that weren't ours on the attractions that weren't ours. Some of these sentences weren't quite put together in a Yeah, you know, yeah. you just have to know what they mean and yep. keep going <laughs> forward. So of course I said yes. He led us back into this area of our building with hydraulics and many other moving parts where guests were experiencing the ride right above us. I mentioned how cool it was, um, how quick everything could move and how dangerous it had to be where we were. He said to me, staring me straight into my soul, do you want to see something really cool? And he took three steps straight back, never losing eye contact. Before I knew what occurred, I was soaked in blood, and a huge piston had torn through his torso. What? Yeah. Bro. Maybe I should have given, like, a... Yeah, maybe a little warning. bit of a trigger warning, <laughs> but bro, maybe he should have given a little trigger warning, like, yeah. hey, I this think this is cool, graphic. you're probably going to be traumatized. You can put that trigger warning at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Straight through, like it was designed to kill him. I turned and ran. I ran out, straight into a manager. Through tears and broken words, I explained where we were and what had happened. I don't remember much after that. I was in my work clothes. They took me to costuming and replaced it. I had to sit down, write a statement. Several, actually. News reported things as hydraulic fluid on guests. How they had managed to hide his death really shocked me. I heard of the mouse cover-ups and conspiracy conspiracies but never thought of never thought my employer would do the same i left work a week later i couldn't climb the stairs or pass that room without a deep sense of panic and the haunting of his eyes i went to work downtown and in 2010 a new area opened up and having grown up with this franchise playing a huge role in my development i had to visit i went and i got the sugary drinks and the rope. I walked towards the castle, and there he was. He wasn't dead. I saw the piston tear through him. The statements. The long-term nightmares. I suffered from watching him back up to his death. I went stole stone cold. He smiled at me with those same haunted eyes. He came up, shook my hand, introduced himself to my family, and said used to know peace that's the reddit user's name <laughs> <laughs> is one of my best trainees ever i thought maybe it was all a horrible dream he offered my family a tour of the building a quick tour of the magic and mayhem insisted that we be backdoored on my account my brain was still reeling and i was just going through the motions i was on the last seat the last one to jump off the edge as off the ledge as we took off and there he wasn't there when we got off the new ride but i knew nothing had stopped i couldn't really talk for the rest of the day i asked other employees about him but they said he took an early release and went home i knew better i waited until a year ago and went to a concert well i was dragged to a concert my boyfriend was dead set on seeing this band and i had to support him I couldn't tell him the story of my trainer. Even I tried to convince myself it wasn't real, so I had no argument not to go. Went straight in into the concert area. We went a little late. I was slow to get ready. My boyfriend exclaimed that the new ride had opened. We had just gone to the ride before the concert. My stomach dropped. I acquiesced. Acquiesced? Acquiesced. I acquiesced. (laughs) We got in line. We hadn't made it 20 feet before I heard his voice. It was the same pattern. Quick hello, you gotta come this way, let me show you around, look at my initials on the building. We got into the ride, it slowly began pulling away, and I hear his echo just over and over again in my head. He's yelling from behind me, do you want to see something really cool? 
dude, that guy's a jerk. Bottom line. <laughs> like, that's one where, okay, again, I know I said I'm going to presume everyone's story is real. But obviously, no, this one didn't actually happen, most likely. I'm sure not, yeah. But I got goosebumps because that guy is a jerk. She can't go anywhere without this dude being like, want to see something really cool? No, you butthead. I don't want to see something really cool. Right. Because the last time you said that, it wasn't really cool. Like, traumatize this poor girl. Yeah, then won't leave her alone. Like, why her? I, I got nothing. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. That guy's a jerk. And even in the afterlife, he's a jerk. You already got her. You already you already bamboozled her into watching you do something horrific and yeah, you just won't leave her alone. But it's like did he really did he really die? Was he always really there? Like was that really when he died? Like I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But the fact that he just keeps like showing up though. And she had to write a statement, so... Yeah. But, I mean, at the same time, too, the whole, like, oh, you know, Disney covered it up. But, you know, they didn't say anything about, like, poor maintenance or he went home early when Homeboy climbed the tracks to the monorail and got run over on grad night. They didn't blame it on poor maintenance for that No, one. they just put that <laughs> in the news, so... <laughs> I think when they can very blatantly, like, blame the person, they're like, yeah, it's their fault. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, I mean, technically that was that with dude's fault. He, like, was like, doop doo doo here I go. I mean, he did yeah. it. It wasn't an oopsie. He did it on purpose. I know, but... Or it was, like, all along, was that his ghost? Well, that's what I'm saying. And, like, he, like him stepping in, that was him, like, doing it in a loop. Yeah. You know, and, like, when she leaves the park, you know, did he find someone else to torment with it? I, I don't know. It's pretty messed up. It is messed up. But that's all the fun stories I have for you. Well, that was fun. So Good old campfire session, if you will. Yeah, I'm sure I'll have more. I always try to come across and find them. Oh, them. yeah. And I mean, you know, we're going to do spooky stuff even when it's not Halloween because that's just it's, who we are. Yep, that's how we roll. I think it's fun. But I think any way. big corporation is going to have like conspiracy theories around them i by no means think disney has some evil whatever the plots that people are putting in these stories again i'm pretty sure this is like those threads where they're making the story seem real and you're supposed to respond as if it's real but i mean i'll say some people are really good writers and i appreciate oh, the fact that everybody puts it out there and i have zero doubts that people have like some people really have had some weird experiences oh of course of course yeah and what i'm gonna say even though that last story where i'm blatantly like that didn't happen like it still spooked me like i got goosebumps on it it was it was a good creepy. it was one. well written it was it was a good creepy one but there's some stuff out there and a lot of it people have logically explained it but like there's videos out there of like ghosts caught on camera in the disney parks yeah so i mean yeah there's all sorts of like actual cast member experiences of yeah the paranormal at the parks and like the one guy i think it was joshua was talking about like you know disney making them sign a contract i don't really doubt that that wasn't true because any i feel like any corporation's gonna be like oh well, yeah like people about our stuff yeah you get yeah you don't want to be giving away giving away the tea there yeah like i mean my company like when it comes to social media, I'm essentially allowed to like what they do. I can't comment on it. I can't share it. Yeah. Like, that's just kind of standard policy for big corporations yeah. about keeping your mouth shut about certain things. Yeah. So. And it's not a big conspiracy theory. It's just a, yeah, don't be telling everybody what we do back here because we don't want people ripping it off. Yep. And knowing all the secrets. So, anyways, I thought it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. Good little way to end the Halloween season. Yeah. So we'll get back to a couple of regular episodes, and then it's going to be Christmas season here soon. Oh, my goodness. So fast. So fast. That right. was fun. And we'll get back to some regular episodes next week. That's it for this week's episode of Ashes and Will Do Disney. 
Don't forget we need your mouse tails. If you have a funny, weird, exciting, or just a favorite Disney memory, send it to ashesandwilldodisney at gmail.com so we can read them on the show. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Ashes and Will Do Disney. This is a public group to follow. We're also on YouTube at Ashes and Will Do Disney. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening and have a magical day.